It's time for the biggest event in Marvel for the year of 2022, the Avengers vs. X-Men vs. The Eternals. Just to give you a very quick background as to where each of these characters are at at the time of this storyline starting, the Avengers are currently inside of a dead celestial known as the Avengers Mountain. They're still protecting the Earth from this home base. The Eternals have just gotten into a battle against Thanos, stopping Thanos and kidnapping his grandfather. He is currently their prisoner. The X-Men are currently on Krakoa, where they have the ability to instantaneously revive if they're ever killed. This power of resurrection is what is going to cause a lot of our problems today. And if you're wondering where you are, this is the Comic Story and Channel, where we take some of your favorite trade paperbacks and single issues and I break them down into digestible bites so that I can give you an audio drama, a narrative, so you know what's going on in the world of comics and can maintain your collection today by going to your local comic book store. All right, today we're going to be covering Avengers vs. X-Men vs. Eternals, known as Axe, issues one through three. Let's get into it. The sun rises over New York as Playboy millionaire Tony Stark sits in a high-end restaurant with the Eternal Cersei stating that they should probably cut to the chase and save everyone a lot of time. Why are we going to be fighting within a day or two? Cersei laughs. Wow, can't even let a girl finish her bloody Mary first. Frankly, I'd much rather be picking a fight with the mutants. They're such plagiarists. Returning to life is our thing. Tony sighs. Yeah, you're not going to make this easy, huh? Cersei goes to take a drink, telling him that he knows that she has never been easy. At least, not in this. Before she could finish her sentence, there's a bright light in the sky as the phoenix comes rocketing in, grabbing Cersei, taking her off into space. A few moments later, Carol Danvers radios in that the target is pacified. They'll bring her in. However, it isn't just the Avengers who have an inkling of a war coming. The mutant destiny also sees it coming, but she can see who it is that they're going to be fighting. Who brings the war? The Eternals. The Eternals will try and kill the mutants. As for why, it is yet to be determined. Nightcrawler rushes in to inform the Quiet Council of Krakoa and the Great Ring of Arakai. Back on Earth, Cersei begins to wake up struggling in her restraints, asking, where am I? Tony walks up in his Iron Man suit, telling her that he needed a safe place to talk to her. So she is here, in Avengers Mountain, but he is a bit suspicious. Cersei asks if he can just get this over with. Do you have a PowerPoint you want to show me or something to wow me into compliance? Ha, <laughs> well, last month, the Eternals snuck into the Avengers Mountain to try and get cosmic stuff. And it was only when your mission failed that you told us the truth, that Thanos was on Earth somehow leading the Eternals. I regret that, Tony. But there are things only the Eternals can know, and only we should stop Thanos. And we did. At that moment, the door opens, and a voice says, This isn't the way, Tony. Cersei was an Avenger. We have to show her some trust. Captain America walks in, stating that the Eternals are going to war. Tell us why, Cersei. Cersei plays coy for a moment, stating that the only war that there will be is when people find out how they've strapped her to an uncomfortable chair. Cap stares, and Cersei's eyes widen. You're serious? A war? An actual war? What do you know? Tony holds up a projection, stating, Thanks to you guys hiding Thanos, I've been monitoring for celestial energy. Last week, we had a huge spike off in the Pacific. In the last 24 hours, there's been a steady pulse. Something is warming up. Cersei tells him that whatever it is, she's not a part of it. The Eternals aren't a team. They're a society. A society that she and her friends left. She isn't the Eternal that they need to worry about. And that Eternal that she is referring to is Druge, which, just an hour prior, spoke before the Council about their need to correct excessive deviation. They've protected the Earth for over a million years, but what they now face are Deviants, and of course he's talking about the mutants. Their exegeme came from the Deviants. They're no longer humans, and they've already colonized Mars. And worse yet, they've escaped the chains of death itself. Their deviation will go on forever. That is why Druge has been honored to be the prime Eternal in these hours. The other Eternals know his plans, and he is just asking for approval from the Unimind. Let him bring fire and death to those whom it's their eternal duty to correct. And with a unanimous vote, Druge's plan was approved. Not only does Druge have the support of the Unimind, but he also has the insider information from another particularly vengeful mutant. 
Dr. Moira McTaggart. Thus, the psychic assault on Krakoa began. But while Professor X and the Quiet Consul began their defense, Druge sent Yoranos, the Undying, to lead the assault on Arakai. But while the attack on Mars will provide a serious detriment in the revival process of the mutants, it wasn't Druge's main plan. He didn't want to stress the system, he wanted to remove it. And that would mean taking out one of its key members, Hope Summers. Wolverine caught wind of the assassin before they had arrived, but it was already too late. Jack of Knives had already incapacitated Hope Summers and stopped Wolverine from getting close before making his escape. While Druge knows of the mutant's key to revival, he also knows how to dismantle their leadership. An attack on the Five and the mutant's ability to revive wasn't the only target of this war. The attack on Arakai was also coordinated with a planned attack on key figures, including Magneto. Druge's plan had worked, mostly. Jack and Knives was not successful in killing Hope, and because of that, he would enact the next part of his plan to remove the mutants, and that was to deploy the Hex. To ensure that the people of Earth rally behind him, Druge then sent out a message to everyone's tech device across the globe. Even though he could psychically tell the world, he felt that that was too invasive. Something that the dirty mutants would do. No, he decided to speak to the world with his own voice and reassure them that as their protectors, they are aware that the mutants have overstepped their bounds. However, they just have to ask everyone to not be afraid of the towering death machines that have emerged off the western seaboard of the United States. Captain America sees all of this coming through, and now with their information from Cersei, he calls out to assemble the Avengers. But before they even determine their plan of attack, the alarms go off to intruders. Tony rushes over as three people appear in the Avengers Mountain. The woman says that her name is Ajak, the Keeper of the Old Way. This is Makari, the Keeper of the New. And the annoying mutant with useful talents whom they gagged is sinister. Allow them to explain. What the Avengers are facing right now is a holy war born of holy scripture. A god can rewrite the scripture and end the war. They just simply need to build a god. Help them build their god. Tony says that the plan is pure hubris. But speaking broadly, I'm pro hubris. But how on earth do you think that we can make a god in a few hours? And Ajax looks around and informs them that Avengers Mountain, their home, is a god. And they're currently living in it. While Tony and the others get to work on figuring out how to create a god, the Hex move into Krakoa, forcing all mutants and X-Men to defend their homeland. But just as things begin to look grim, Cap and the Avengers jump in asking how they can help. Cyclops holds out his hand to shake Cap's, telling him, Things are bleak, Cap. I know, but they've been bleaker, Cyclops. We're gonna get through this. The whole world will see us standing together. Plus, Iron Man is working on a peaceful solution. In the meantime, what are your objectives? Cyclops says that most mutants are non-combatants. They need to get them to defensive vaults. The Eternals are also trying to destroy their method of reincarnation. If they take that down, the Eternals win. Just handle the Hex and get people to safety. We'll protect the Resurrection. Cap says he's on it. But even now, still keeping secrets? After everything we've been through, you should have told us, Cyclops. After everything? How could we, Cap? The battle rages on. The air support focusing on the flying hex, while the more water-able heroes focus on the ones below. Namor manages to cut off part of the hex, but as the attack continues, it misses, and Namor shouts, asking, YOU DARE TOUCH NAMOR! Then there's another attack, and a shockwave is sent out into the ocean, sending a tidal wave aimed right at the Philippines. Jean Grey tells everyone that if they don't do something, thousands are going to die, and Cyclops tells Cap to hurry up and deal with the fallout. It's one less problem for them to worry about. Cap tells him thanks. Your hero's here, and one day, people will see the X-Men for what they really are. However, as the Avengers go to handle the tidal wave, all the other mutants just see the Avengers running from the fight, leaving them to fight on their own. They all call out, calling the Avengers cowards. And then, of course, they've left the mutants to their own devices. But after a long, hard-fought battle, they do prevail even without the Avengers' help. Thanks to their methods of resurrection, their losses aren't things to even worry about. Many perished, but many revived. Though their victory doesn't last long, the Hex are Eternals, and as their name implies, they too revive. 
This time, the Hex don't direct their attacks at the mutants, but they attack the island of Krakoa directly. Because if there is no island, they can't evacuate or revive. The mutants pray for something, anything to deliver them, and their call is answered. A god is coming! Suddenly, the thunderous voice of a once dead celestial calls out, Cease! The Hex, descendants of the Celestials, all stop to their higher power, and they begin to retreat from Krakoa. Tony and the others celebrate for narrowly succeeding, and Ajax says that they have wrought a great work here today. They have their god, and their god is just. But the Celestial continues. People of Earth, listen. You are bickering children. This planet is ruined. You have acted with unrelenting unkindness to one another. You leave me no option. This is your judgment day. You have 24 hours to justify yourselves. You will be judged individually. You will be judged as a collective. If there is more that is just than wicked, you will live. And if you are found lacking, there will be no tomorrow. As the world watches and waits for judgment at the North Pole, many of the Avengers and Eternals question how their new god could be so unjust, determining all of Earth is not truly worthy of life. But while the world waits to be judged, the progenitor sees Captain America being the first to step in to solve their problem, and the progenitor decides to judge him. The projection of Cap's image begins to descend upon everyone, and the progenitor speaks that he is the dream of a better country. That this man has tried to inspire it for a century. This country is the world leader, and the world is what it is. It is worse every day, and you are a failure. The projection gives a thumbs down. Tony looks at Cap. If it judges Cap by that standard, what chance do the rest of us have? Cap stumbles to his feet. We're not playing its game. Not unless there's no other option. We have to find a way out of this. I'll try to keep the rest of the world calm. Cap begins to broadcast himself to the entire world, and Tony and the others hurry inside to determine the course of action. But as Tony is beginning to work at the internals of the god, thinking of what they could attack, Ajax tells him that they are not going to attack their god. Fasto says that death to it would cause a backlash to the Eternals. The war could be over, but if they destroy it and they unleash the unimaginable power that it holds, the explosion could be life-threatening. Ajax leaves, stating that they will find another way. But as she does, Fastos quietly says that now that the priests are gone, listen carefully. If they can find a way to do so safely, they should do it. Ajax is a believer. Makari is nearly as bad. The Eternals could make a sacrifice for them all. This is their fault. The world has outgrown the Eternals. However, he should know that if he starts this plan, they will have to act to stop it. Their principles will force them, and if they do it, do it safely and do it secretly. Mr. Sinister begins to laugh. <laughs> oh, how I love secrets. Make it safe and make it hell. Got it. But while he smiles to them, mentally he's reaching out to Destiny, asking if she can hear him. He has the most useful information that she could ever desire. While fighting a war in Krakoa, Destiny calls for a council meeting and Emma Frost asks if it can wait. An army of tireless eternal psychics are giving her a rather pounding headache. Destiny insists, and as everyone is mentally brought in, she informs everyone of the Avengers' plans. However, they should know that it could cause considerable devastation. Time is of the essence, and the Eternals will block this unless they act swiftly. She calls for an immediate vote. Destiny, Shaw, Mystique, Exodus, and Hope all vote yes, while Colossus, Nightcrawler, and Kate vote no. And while Emma abstains, the motion is passed. The ones against question the morality that this could pose, but Destiny says that Jean and Scott left this circle due to moral quibbles. They chose to be the implements of policy, and they here are the Quiet Council. Nightcrawler asks if they can send in a strike force. They moved their best away from Krakoa and the Eternals will overwhelm them. Emma says that she may be able to provide some assistance there. So moments later, at the battlefield on Krakoa, a gate opens as dozens of beings walk through and Cyclops yells, Look out! The Eternals have crossed the gates! But the leader of the group corrects him. We are not Eternals. Almost the complete opposite, really. My name is Crow and we are the Deviants. And we are here to stand with our fraternity against the eternal persecutors. Cyclops says that the mutants are not deviants and Crow says, Well, we can pass through your gates. 
We share enough genes for that. But to be honest, new friend, anyone on the wrong end of the Eternals is enough for the Deviants. Save the world, X-Men. We'll blunt the Eternals' blades without numbers. We've been doing that for a long time. But back with Tony and the others, Tony is quietly trying to formulate a plan, just as Fasto suggested. But before long, the alarms go off, indicating intruders again. Ajax looks around and says that there is an army of mutants attacking the Celestial. As Tony looks back, he sees Sinister disarming the alarms, and he shouts at him, What are you doing? Sinister deactivates the controls. Uh, oops. Fasto says that he just opened up a way to the node. They're coming for that, and Tony yells that millions could die. The Sinister says that maybe, but billions will definitely live. You won't thank me, of course. I'm used to that. But you can say please and thank you later. Well, maybe you can't, since you really can't resurrect like us, so toodles! Within seconds of the attack on the progenitor, the Eternal's principles activate. All of them are now placed under a trance-like state, all repeating to protect the Celestials. Outside, Jean says that they may as well drop the stealth tech. Why couldn't this just be easy for once? And Wolverine tells them, look in the bright side. We're all experienced in doing this the old-fashioned way. As the battle erupts, Jean rushes into the opening and Tony chases after, telling her that she needs to stop. She turns to him. I am sorry. And then attacks the node, telling the others that it is done. Tony says, yes, it's done. And maybe we're done too. If this node goes, there's a chance that the whole celestial goes. The shockwave could hit cities and... Jean stops. I, I didn't know. I, sh I should have known. Why didn't I know? She asks Tony if it's going to go off and he looks back smiling. I just checked the readings. It looks like it'll all... But before he could finish, the progenitor begins to crack at its power leak. And then finally, it explodes, sending a shockwave of destruction all across the globe. And after a few moments of sheer pain, death, and agony, everyone blinks. Jean looks up. That wasn't real. We were inside of its mind this whole time. I, I should have known. The progenitor then speaks to the word. It tells everyone that their heroes think themselves above judgment. Now you will all see that you are mistaken. Your day ticks away. Justify yourselves. While everyone on both sides argues amongst themselves, Cersei sneaks into the exclusion while her guide tells her to be quiet. She says that she is being quiet, but Jack of Knives tells her that she just kicked a molecule and another and another. She tells him that she appreciates his help, but Jack says that he is not joining them. This is a job. This is just a paycheck. I'll get your target out. The two of them reach the vault door and a voice in the other side asks who's there. Cersei tells the man to be quiet. They're going to break him out. The world is in trouble, and she thinks that only he can help get the world singing from the same hymn sheet. Now she knows this is eternal business, but some of them have never just been Eternals. She thought perhaps it's time for a little of the old Avengers Assemble for Star Fox. Star Fox leans forward, telling her, Well, I love the idea. The world will have to realize that all you need is love. And there you go, guys. We have wrapped up issues one through three of Avengers vs. X-Men vs. The Eternals. Now, the reason we're breaking this one up is it's going to go into issues four and five, then it's going to go into a couple of the spin-off issues, and then it's going to conclude. So if you want to get all of that within the next week to a week and a half, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit that like button and let me know down below how excited you are to see where this is going. Because this is the first Marvel event in a little while that I actually got pretty into. I was really deep into seeing what was going on with this. And if you guys end up really enjoying this, we'll look at doing some of the spin-offs, like when Spider-Man was being judged and stuff like that. So let me know in the comments down below. And if you want early access to all of our products, make sure you go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash comicstorian, or join up for YouTube memberships. We'll see you next time right here.